Morning, church. Morning, The words will be on the screen, but if you want to turn in your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 1, please. I'm not sure where the book of Acts is. Find the book of Zephaniah, and it's eight books further on. <laughs> ah. Now, Christmas Day is a day that we celebrate and remember that Jesus entered the world. Good Friday is the day that we remember that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And Easter Sunday is the day that we celebrate he rose from the dead. Not too deep for you yet, is it? Good. But we sometimes miss or maybe give sparse attention to the kind of culmination, if you like, of the gospel story about Jesus, his bodily return to heaven. Something that Christians call the Ascension. Now, Ascension Day was actually on Thursday just gone, because it's, it's 40 days after Easter Sunday. So it was on Thursday, and uh, there may be some of you here that are actually old enough to remember when it was a day of school. Any of you here, yeah? Goodness me. Well, that was obviously a long time before my time. But we're going to focus today on this, and we're going to read the account of the Ascension in Acts chapter 1. Now, uh, Ian's going to be speaking on this passage again next week, but he'll be looking at it uh, a different part of it uh, than I'm going to be looking at today. And just to, as a reminder, you, there will be um, a fair few of us away next week, a church weekend, but we have got a service on here, so if you're not at the church weekend, do please come along, and Ian will be leading us through that. So Acts chapter 1, hopefully, there we go, yeah. I'm reading from the first verse, but I'm reading from the English Standard Version, so it might be slightly different from yours, uh, and this is what it says. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days. From now. So when they'd come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Let's just pray. Father, we just come to you and we just so recognise our need of you now. And Lord, my words are just dry, empty words unless you breathe your spirit through them. So just come to us now, Lord. Open our hearts. Open our hearts to truth that, Lord, we might love you, worship you and know you more. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I was uh, looking up on the internet this week uh, some of the most important historical journeys that have taken place. I found a few on there from uh, this uh, company on the internet called Travel Pulse and uh, just wondered uh, if any of you were aware of them. I've kind of stuck a few in kind of day order. So here's the first one. Any of you heard of Christopher Columbus? Yes, yes? yeah. Um, they played for Arsenal, I believe. No, he didn't. 
Uh, well, there's the first journey. Back in the 1400s, about 1492, he went from Spain all the way and was meant to be the first European, although this is contested, to uh, discover the New World over there, America. So, Christopher Columbus. Any of you heard of this next guy? He's from Portugal. Vasco da Gama. Any of you heard of him? Well, some of you may have done. Well, apparently he's the first to sail all the way around, amazing journey, around underneath Africa and up and across over there to India. That's Vasco da Gama. Let's go on to another one. Anyone heard of James Cook? Yes. This was quite an amazing journey all the way from England, all the way around Africa and then and landed on the east coast of Australia. Got actually got a little bit stuck on the barrier reef. They had to throw some stuff overboard to release themselves. So, uh, so there we go. Let's bring it a bit more up to date. I'm sure many of you remember this journey. Any remember watching on? Did they, was it on telly? Did you watch it on telly or listen to it on the radio? Yeah, a uh, few of our. Uh, uh, mature folk at the back, remember that, yeah. Uh, this amazing trip when they actually left the planet Earth and went onto the moon, remember all that? This is one small step for man, remember all that kind of stuff. So there we go, that's an amazing journey. Here's another one you might not know of, you may have heard of a man called James Cameron. He's a film director, yeah? Well, he had a journey downwards to the deepest part in Earth, Mariana Trench, in the, in the ocean, in the Pacific Ocean there. He went down, must have been in some kind of specially prepared submarine, 10,908 metres down. That is pretty awesome, isn't it? I mean, the pressure's down there in the darkness. One last one here. This is a Curiosity rover. And this is a, something that we sent out into space, apparently, uh, and over to go on to Mars. So it travelled over to Mars. It landed, this is quite amazing, just 2.4 kilometres from where it should have done on the surface of Mars after travelling 563 million kilometres. What a journey. And it was there within two kilometres of where it was meant to land. So, uh, yeah, a, quite an amazing journey. Quite a few amazing journeys there. We all make journeys, don't we? Journeys are a part. You've all made a journey here this morning. Might only have been a shorter one, uh, but journeys are good. I remember journeys. Do you remember journeys when you were young? We used to, well, we moved down to uh, Exeter when I was about seven uh, from up north, and we used to travel back to Yorkshire in the car in the 70s. And mum and dad had one of these big Cortina estates. Remember there, many of you? And uh, we used to do things that you couldn't do now. That, you know, some, we used to travel sometimes at night time. They used to put the back seats down and, and they used to put a mattress on the back. And we used to just lie there, me and my sister. We used to play I Spy, used to play I Spy and all that. We used to have sweets every half hour or something like that. And we used to have arguments, me and my sister. I used to say things like, Mom, she's looking out of my window. And all that kind of thing, you know, generally being a pain like children can be. Well, what happened in the gospel is actually, or could be centred around a journey. It's actually the greatest journey ever. You see, scripture tells us that from the very beginning Jesus existed with God as a word, as a word. but he didn't stay there in heaven. He journeyed downward. He took on human flesh. He lived for us, revealing God. He died on the cross for our sins. Then he went to the lowest part of the journey, down into the abode of the dead. Then he was raised from the dead, as we remember, on Easter Sunday. And finally, the culmination of the journey journey that we remember on the ascension, he took his place back in heaven again at the right hand of God. And Luke, at the end of Luke and at the beginning of Acts, portrays Jesus coming as a journey. A journey from heaven to earth, but then again from heaven, uh, from earth back to heaven. And it's a final leg of this journey back to heaven that Christians know as the ascension. So, this ascension then, I mean, is it just a fitting kind of conclusion to the journey? Is it just a way of kind of expressing, you know, Jesus made it back again? Do you remember when your mom used to say to you, give me three rings when you get in so I know you've got back safe? Do you remember that? Was this just kind of way of us knowing that Jesus got back to heaven all right, he arrived safe and all that kind of thing? Well, 
The ascension is actually included in the great early creeds, the foundational creeds of Christianity. Both the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed state in them that Jesus ascended into heaven. Do you remember the song that we sang, the second song? Uh, we believe in God our Father. It's called the Creed. And did you notice there's a reference to the ascension in that second verse? Descended into darkness, he rose in glorious light. And then the next line, forever seated high. That's a reference to the ascension. And so it seems that the ascension, this end of this greatest journey, was a significant and important event. Something else, I don't know if you noticed this as well. It's interesting to note, if you remember the scriptures, that Jesus told the, uh, uh, the disciples in the upper room before he died, he told them that he would be leaving. And they were told in scripture that they were sad and that they were troubled at the thought of it. They didn't want him to go. And we can get that, can't we? Yet in the reading that Sandra brought to us earlier from the end of Luke 24, it said that after Jesus ascended, the disciples returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Why do you think that was? Why do you think the change from the upper room? Why is it after the ascension they're now full of joy? Something significant has happened. And yes, it's part of the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. But something significant too about the ascension. So I want us to look at that just for a bit this morning. And one of the reasons why the disciples' sadness could turn to joy. So let's look in the back book of Acts that we've just read. Now it's quite clear in this account uh, that Luke gives us in the book of Acts that something they saw, the disciples saw something with their physical eyes. They saw Jesus taken up and were told in verse 9 that a cloud took him out of their sight. A cloud. Let's just consider that for a moment. What's the significance of the cloud? Is Luke giving us a weather report of a particular day in Jerusalem 40, year, uh, 40 days after the resurrection? And if so, if he's doing that, it could be a word for us Brits, couldn't it? Because don't we love talking about the weather? We just do, don't we? You know, it's too hot, it's too cold, it's too dry, it's too wet. We're never happy, and it's something that we always talk to. Is that what Luke's saying? Is, a, is he saying, oh, it was a shame about the weather, it was a cloudy day, so, you know, the clouds meant where we missed, lost sight of Jesus, you know, blooming weather. Is that what Luke's saying? I've got a sneaky feeling that it's not. Neither do I think, uh, as some people might, that the cloud was the kind of chariot that Jesus hopped onto that took him up into the sky and beyond into outer space. But there is a clue in the cloud about the ascension, the completion of this greatest journey. Turn to the person next to you and say, there's a clue in the cloud. <laughs> now, you need to remember, everybody, that God is invisible, can't be seen with a naked eye. But God does want to make himself and his presence known to his people throughout, throughout scripture, God gave certain visible, tangible signs of his presence. Do you remember when the Israelites were in the wilderness that God led them by a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day? That's right. Do you remember in Exodus chapter 19 as the Israelites gathered around Mount Sinai God said he was going to come down and meet with them in a dense cloud. Do you remember in the reading that Sandra brought to us? Well done. Good stuff, Sandra. Do you remember in the reading that Sandra brought to us from Leviticus 16 earlier, in what form God said he would appear over the atonement cover in the tabernacle? A cloud. Do you remember... When Solomon built the temple in 1 Kings 8, and it was dedicated, that the glory of God filled the temple in the form of a... Do you remember 
The account of the transfiguration in the New Testament, yeah, and he's on the mountain and he's transfigured before them a few disciples. Do you remember what it was that enveloped those disciples from which they heard the very voice of God? A cloud. You're getting good at this, aren't you? You're getting the idea. God appeared in the form of a cloud. It was a tangible sign of God's presence. And this cloud in Acts that hid him from the sight of the disciples is linked to the cloud, I believe, that appeared over the atonement cover in the tabernacle there in Leviticus chapter 16. And to a journey that took place in the tabernacle. Now... This journey that took place in the life of Israel every year, it was the most important journey of their year. And I've got a picture up there. This was known, and this was a reading that was brought to us by Sandra, this was known as the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur as it's called in Hebrew. And what would happen, a very quick truncated version, have you got one of these? Oh yeah, brilliant, thank you. Uh, the high priest, and he did this a couple of times, he would make a journey along the tabernacle. Now this is a tabernacle like the holy tent. Only the priests could come into this bit. This was the holy place. And this was the most holy place. And God would dwell in the form of a cloud just there over the Ark of the Covenant. And what would happen? The high priest once a year, and only the high priest, and only once a year, would make the journey. He would, what he would do, he'd come and he'd offer sacrifice on here on the altar and then he'd come through and journey through and then eventually he'd come to here and he'd sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice there in uh, that place where God dwelled, in that most holy place where the cloud was over the atonement cover. And he did this to cover the sins not only of himself but the sins of God's people. And they were then covered until the next year when the same thing would happen again. So there was this journey that took place that the high priest did every year. The most important journey in the life of the Israelite community. Have you got that? Say yes, Pastor Carl. Yes, Pastor Carl. Good. You're doing well this morning. You're doing really hard. Let's move back. That journey that we've just looked at in the tabernacle was kind of a rehearsal and a prefiguring of a much greater journey. A return journey, in fact. The journey that we're looking at today. The ascension. For in the ascension, Jesus, our great high priest, who gave himself as a once-for-all sacrifice for our sins, in the ascension, he entered back into the true tabernacle in heaven, into the very presence of God, just like that high priest in Israel, in order to present the blood of his own sacrifice for our sins and to plead it over his people. And in the third reading that we have from Hebrews chapter 9, he links those two journeys together, the high priest of Israel and the ascension of Jesus, our great priest. And that's because this ascension journey of Jesus fulfilled the journey of the high priest in the Old Testament. Let me just remind you of that scripture where it says, But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, that is the one in heaven, not made with human hands. That is to say, not part of this creation. Listen, he did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place that is in heaven once for all by his own blood, so obtaining eternal redemption. Are you starting to see it? You see, in the ascension, Jesus enters into heaven, presents his blood as a sacrifice for our sins, and consequently, we are now covered. Not just for another year, but for eternity. Amen. You see, you've got to get back to these disciples again. Although it would have been hard for them to say goodbye, they had grasped that it was much more important for all of us that Jesus should complete his journey, return to the heavenly sanctuary 
apply his blood to cover our sins. It was much more important for him to do that than it was to stay here on earth with us. And not only that, it was far more important that he stays there in heaven and continues to plead. He continues to intercede, to be the go-between, to be the mediator between humanity and God. Constantly pleading his blood before the Father. Perhaps you might want to imagine it a bit like this. Imagine if singing out a tune was a crime. Might be a couple of you out there would be really worried, wouldn't you? Real potential criminals, eh? Imagine if singing out a tune was a crime that carried the death sentence. People have heard you singing and, oh, goodness me, it's awful. And you've been arrested and you've been convicted and you're in prison, in your cell, and you're awaiting your trial. You know what you need? You need a really good lawyer, don't you? In fact, you need the best lawyer that you can get. And you manage to get a great lawyer, you discover not only is he a great lawyer, but he's a great person too, and he visits you in your cell, and he makes you feel comfortable and peaceful. You can talk to him about the difficulties of life inside prison, and he understands, and your relationship with him, you know, in the cell is really good, it's really important to you. But of course, the place that you most need him is not with you in the cell, it's in the court. It's in the courtroom. However good your relationship might be with him in the cell, however important, what you most need from that lawyer is a competent performance in court. And if he can't do that for you, he can't do the thing that you need most from him. Now listen, church. Our greatest need as sinners as those whose lives are often out of tune with God and with one another. Our greatest need, as those who fall short of God's holiness, is not comfort here on earth, but an effective defence or a representative in the heavenly courts. My greatest need is to have someone defend me there, be an advocate for me, to plead my case before Almighty God. And when Jesus ascended into heaven, he went there to the court of heaven, to the place that you and I most need him to be, to present and plead his blood in order that my sin and yours might be atoned for and covered. You see, one day we will all have to stand before God to give an account of our lives. Now God is utterly holy. A consuming fire who will not tolerate sin. Who will not allow sin into his new creation. So how would we fare if we have no one to stand in our defence before him? Do you know that the case for our prosecution is continually being brought to God by the one scripture calls the accuser, Satan. And let's be honest, it's not hard for him to point out ways in which you and I have fallen short. It's not hard for him to point out ways in which we've sinned, in which we've missed the mark. The accuser, Satan, has got a good case against me and against you. He's gathered together evidence of our guilt and the reasons that we should be condemned because we're sinful and therefore we deserve judgment. It doesn't sound good or look good, church. But then, imagine in the court of heaven, Jesus, our defence lawyer, arising 
and exclaiming, while all this is true, and while you and I, his clients, plead guilty to the charges of sin. He has marked in his hands and his feet a full pardon purchased by his blood, which he brought into heaven itself when he ascended to God and which he continually pleads over us. And the Father, imagine the Father looks at Jesus and the blood that covers and atones for our sins. And then he looks at those who trust in Jesus. And he says, Forgiven and accepted. Forgiven and accepted. Can you begin to see why the disciples rejoiced? Jesus was right there where they needed him to be, at the right hand of God, interceding for us and pleading for us. The disciples were filled with joy because they realised the ascended Christ had now completed this greatest and most important journey ever. He's entered into heavenly courts, into the heavenly tabernacle, in the very presence of God, and offers his blood to cover our sins. And he's seated there now, Alive forevermore, pleading for me and you. Aren't you glad he's there this morning? Aren't you glad he completed the journey? Because now, you see, before the throne of God above, we have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love. Whoever lives and pleads for me, our name is written on his hands, our name is hidden in his heart. We know that while in heaven he stands, no power can force us to depart. And if like me, if you're like me, when Satan tempts me to despair, what do I do? Upward I look, and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Saviour died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. So this morning, church, as we remember the ascension, the end and the culmination of the greatest journey ever. Can we, through the eyes of faith, behold him there, the risen Lamb, our perfect, sinless righteousness, the great, unchangeable I am, the King of glory, and of grace, because one with our Lord, we cannot die. Our soul is purchased with his blood. Our life is safe with Christ on high. With Christ, our Saviour and our God. Praise be to the crucified, risen, and ascended Lord. Amen. I'm going to invite the band to come up.